Ernst, um, welcome to the channel. Hi there. Um, one of the things we want to talk about today uh, deals with the Vargas, and I wanted to go into the Hora, so maybe we'll get to that towards the end. Uh, but the Shashtiamsha, that's something a lot of people ask me about. And I use the Shashtiamsha for dignity when it comes to looking at doshas, and I use the Shashtiamsha to see how our planetary lord is going to work based on like if you read that the fifth Shashtiamsha is Yaksha, the celestial singer. So there's a lot to the Shashtiamsha, and I think there's a lot that we don't understand. So I'm curious what your take is on it and how you use it specifically. Okay. I mean, I would say hands down the Shashtiamsha is going to be your most important Varga. And the reason I say that is because it's the Varga that differentiates our life the most. It changes on average. You, you know, uh, it's every half a degree is a different Shashtiamsha. So every two minutes on average, the person's ascendant is going to change Shashtiamshas. Also, there are different house cusps, of which there's a total of 12, are going to be changing at different times from the ascendant. You know, and there's the house cusps were opposite each other, so that gives you six pairs. So mm -hmm. really, in a, in a two-minute, it's not even a two-minute period, it's two minutes divided by six there's going to be a change in your Shashtiamsha, which is every 20 seconds on average, there'll be a change in the Shashtiamsha somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important for differentiating your time, um, your birth. And really the truth is we all do slovenly astrology. We're, we're all just slobs. We sit there and we look at the Rashi chart and we make a prediction that applies to everyone born within two hours. Mm -hmm. It's a miracle we're ever right. And then, then we, then we go, oh, I'm going to use the Navamsha. Now I'm making predictions born with ev to everyone within 13 minutes. Well, at the Shashtiamsha, if you only use the Lagna, you're making predictions about everyone born within two minutes. Mm -hmm. If you use all your Bavakas, you're making predictions to everyone born within 20 seconds. And now you're dealing just with the person in question. And so we really, sh if we're really doing good astrology from a scientific point of view, we really should be using Shashtiamsha every time, mm -hmm. along with, you know, the other Varga charts, all of them all the time. Right. Um, and if you actually use all the Vargas all the time, on average, you'll have a change of some Bavakas and some Varga every four seconds. And you'd be surprised how just one Bavakas changing in one Varga chart changes the destinies of two people. Mm -hmm. So the only way we're really doing real astrology, we're really talking about the person burn at that time is if we include the Vargas, the most important, which is the Shashtiamsha. Right. Parashara tells us that the Shashtiamsha is for all things. So we're supposed to look at it for everything. Other Vargas have a much more limited scope where they're meant to be focused on, your, you know, our wealth, our, our fortune, whatever, our spouse and so on. But this is for all things. And it's a 12th house Varga, meaning that, that we divide each sign into 60 parts. Well, if we divide 60 by 12, it goes in there four times, which is 48, with the remainder of 12, which tells us that the focal house is the 12th house. The 12th house is a house of resolutions, conclusions, ending. It's the final thing that you're with. In fact, one of the things the 12th house represents is the gain of the last desire. Mm -hmm. Like the last thing you want before you die. Like Yogananda wanted coconuts, fresh coconut milk. Last de desire on earth before he went to his Mahasamadhi. Samadhi. Right. And somebody shows up from India with some coconuts, right? <laughs> he knows it's over. <laughs> you no, know it's over. It's time to go. <laughs> so there's always this, this final, the final thing, the end. Mm -hmm. The end of everything. And in Hindu mythology or not mythology religion i like to say the beginning and the end are the only things that are real everything else is uh, not real only the beginning and end so those are the important points and the shashtiamsha being a 12th house varga shows us the end of everything mm -hmm. after it's all said and done what are we stuck with what do we have is it something desirable or something we don't like is it something that's enjoyable something that's stressful so it's going to show us the bottom line of everything 
And so we should look at that. We might see wondrous, amazing things in a chart, but if the bottom line in the Shashti Amsha is mediocre, it's not going to be as that amazing, that wonderful. It's right. going to be better. It's going to be a high mediocre. Mm-hmm. So, so when, you're, have, when you're looking at that, when you're looking at the Shashti Amsha and you're considering, is it good? Is it bad? Um, are you looking at the chart, you know, from your perspective as though it is a chart in and of itself and you're looking at dignity or are you referring to like the 60 got, different Shashti Amshas with the different, you know, goddesses, okay. gods represented, those sorts of things? The most important thing is to read the chart as a chart. Okay. So you look at the plant's dignities. You look at what, how the connections of the planets, the Rashi aspects of the planets, where the planets are, the conjunctions the planets have, just like you would any chart. Whatever technique you like using, use it. Gotcha. It's not that there's only certain ways you can read the Shashti Amsha. Read the Shashti Amsha with the favorite way you like to read charts. <clears throat> and if it contradicts something you see in another chart, you actually sort of need to go more with the sway of the Shashti Amsha. Hmm. Okay. okay. So that makes it sort of a, actually a good beginning point to start with. And one real simple thing people can do to start with the Shashti Amsha is they can just read the Dasha Lord in the Shashti Amsha and say, okay, sort of the ceiling of the Dashi Lord, the highest potential of this Dasha Lord is as indicated in the Shashti Amsha. Mm-hmm. And you, you read it and you say, okay, this Dasha has, this is the highest ceiling it can be. Mm-hmm. And in any other Varga, you look, you read it, the Dash Lord in the context of that ceiling that the Shashti Amsha has to offer. Right, any Varga. So you read all of any Varga, you match it up to the Shashti Amsha. In this Dasha, the seventh house love limits in the Shashti Amsha is this high. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to predict anything higher in the other Varga charts. Ah, excellent, yes. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of use it as a ceiling. Mm-hmm. The same way, you know how you like to use the Dasha Lord as the ceiling of how good things can be in that Dasha? Right. If you've got a really good Dasha Lord, and for, say, wealth, then you've got some sub-dashes on good wealth. You're never going to predict the person's going to be destitute, right? Right. Same with the Shashtyamsha. It's like that Dasha Lord gives the ceiling. The Shashtyamsha gives the ceiling, too. The ceiling is showing strong wealth. If other Vargas are showing terrible wealth, you don't ever want to predict it. Mm-hmm. You know, relevant to their ceiling, they'll still get low wealth in those times. But you would, that, that ceiling would never allow for destitution. All right, but this is okay. definitely going to be dependent on having the correct Shashti Amsha, though. <laughs> it's going to be dependent on having the correct Shashti Amsha. Right. And that's the thing about if we truly want to do scientific astrology, meaning read a, a chart rather than use our intuition to pull things out of the ether, you know, mm-hmm. you have accurate birth time. That's just a sad fact about astrology. Um, and what I found with the Shashti Amsha is that it's, it should be a check for everything we do. If we make a prediction without c- confirming somehow through some technique in the Shashti Amsha, we're sort of closing one eye when we take that prediction. Mm-hmm. We're literally covering an eye and saying, okay, this is what I see with one of my eyes shut. Mm-hmm. If we have the right time exactly, and we look at the Shashti Amsha, now we're seeing with both eyes, which means the predictions we make are more likely to be accurate. Right. So if an astrologer makes a bad prediction, it doesn't mean he read your Navamsha wrong. It just means... He didn't read your Shashti Amsha. <laughs> right. You know but, what I mean? Yeah, but it seems that, you know, people make a big deal. This is one other point. People make a big deal about the Navamsha. So it seems to me that we should spend more time looking at the Shashti Amsha rather than the Navamsha. I mean, based on what you're saying. Yeah, I think overall you should. For, for the entire gist of life, you should. But then I remember we had a conversation one time and you mentioned that people didn't even really start using Vargas until like the 80s or something like that. Can you say a little bit more about that? Sure. Do you remember what we were talking about? You'll find that the majority of astrologers until recent years, like since, you know, after we were born, me and you, us young right. ones, you know, yeah. the, the astrologers don't have all full gray hair, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you, the people use the Navamsha. Mm-hmm. Some astrologers, but not all. Um, different parts of India, different astrologers would use different things, or astrologers tend to use different things. Um, I some ast- some regions they put a lot more emphasis on Navamsha, mm-hmm. um, but a lot of regions they just looked at Lagna and Chandra Lagna. Like right. I have a, a lot of relatives in India. When I'm there, I'm always getting people and their friends coming up with their horoscopes, and um, they hand me their charts that were made when they were when they were born 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, handwritten charts. 
And all, the, all it is is Chandralagna and Rashi. In most cases, no Navamsha. Only in 10% of the cases did they even bother calculating the Navamsha. All right. But you don't think that's because these astrologers are so brilliant that they knew the calculations and they could see that it was at a degree and then could no. fill it in. No. If, if they were that brilliant, why would they have to make a Chandra Lagna? Ah, a yes. To me, a separate Chandra Lagna chart's a waste of space. Right. Just look at the same chart and read it, the same box, and look at it from Moon, right? right. You don't need a whole separate Kundali for that. Mm -hmm. But they'll do that, particularly in North India, because they use a North Indian chart, so they want the Moon on the top of the diamond. Right. So... I was like, wow, these guys are just using this really simple astrology. And it was, that doesn't mean they weren't uh, capable of making great predictions. They, mm -hmm. they were. But we also have to understand they lived in a much more simple society mm -hmm. where the possibilities of predictions were just one, two, or three. There was only three right answers to the question. You, you, mean, you mean sort of like if someone asks you, should my son be an engineer, a doctor, or a lawyer? Those kinds of three things? I'm talking India used to even be more simple than that. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a lot of these simple cultures. And now the modern world everywhere, including India, is so complex. Mm -hmm. The amount of right possible answers are overwhelming, staggering, overwhelming, that we're sort of at this time really much more forced to look at the chart. Right. You know? Um, like, you know, 50 years ago, someone said, am I going to have a love marriage in India? You don't have to look at their chart to say no. Right. <laughs> Somebody asks you that question, you actually have to read the chart. Right. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. It, it's very different. Um, so, anyway, the Shashti Amsha is that mo the most differentiating varga between you and the person born after you, or right, right before you, or born at the same time two miles away. So that's why that's my wife. My, why my wife, who's a twin, uh, she she's been married to me the whole time. You know, God bless her. <laughs> and we don't have any children. And yet, her sister, who's a twin, has two children and has been married twice. Right? Because there's a difference there. Yeah, it's because your wife shot temperature, so and her husband's also her child. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe true. Yeah, exactly. One of the reasons for that is going to be the shot temperature. Yeah. And the other reasons will be the other Varga changes. I, I was really fortunate. I have three kids. I have all their times to the exact second. My, and then I have twins. Mm -hmm. whose Time is exactly like 59 seconds different. Mm -hmm. And my twins were born about almost four weeks early. One of them was really small. So they left her in the hospital when they, when they didn't. So I'm like going, wow, why, why is this happening? You know, they're born, why is one stuck in the hospital? So I, I looked at it, and the answer was in the Shashti Amsha. So I used a Jamini Rashi Dasha, and I, based on the Shashti Amsha, I predicted the kid would come home on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And I was on, after they'd already been there like eight or nine days. And I, I called them on Friday morning, I said, how does it look? And they said, oh, it's going to be at least another week. Mm -hmm. I said, we'll see. Then they, the next morning, they called me really early. I said, you could come pick up your kid on a Saturday. All right. Because of the, it was in the Shashti Amsha. The Rashi charts of both kids were the same. All right. But the fact that one kid had to get, stay in the hospital for 11 days All right. was shown in the Shashti Amsha. So what, what changed there? Was it, was it the, the Rashi Dasha changed and therefore it triggered a different part of the Shashti Amsha? Yeah. It was triggering a different Rashi in the in the in the Shashti. The Shashti. It was triggering the same Rashi. Okay. But the Rashi represented different things. Different things, right? Okay. Right. So your your Vimshatri dashas aren't going to really change that much. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, you're going to be running Venus dasha in both charts that are a minute apart, right? Right. And one person's Venus dasha rolls and a, a, a little bit, few hours maybe before the others, right? Mm -hmm. But they're going to be running the same dasha, and Venus is going to rule the same things, but then it'll rule different house cusps in the Shashti Amsha. Right. Okay. Um, but so, in, so you're, so you're sticking with the cusps? What? So you're sticking with the cusps. So, you know, we've got the cusps. I know they're going to be different throughout the Shashti Amsha, but do you also read it from the houses? Like, for example, if you have the first cusp in Scorpio, would you look at the fifth house within the Shashti Amsha, yeah, or would you find both. the cusps? Both things will change. Look at both. Okay. You really need to, really to see everything. You want to look at both. Gotcha. Of the two, the cusps are more important, but you want to look at both. Okay. And really, I don't want to tell anyone how to read, read the Shashtyamcha. Read it with what you do. Right. 
because everyone has their techniques. And if they work in your, if they work, if they're good techniques, I'll work on Shastyamsha. But you can't, you can't do planetary aspects, right? You got to take those from. Uh, I don't use planetary aspects in the Varga. It's just Rashi aspects. Right. Just Rashi aspects. Okay, great. Okay. But there is a couple things that you have to focus on, on the Shastyamsha. There's some things that are more important than others. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing, as I've mentioned in the Shastyamsha, it's a 12th house Varga. Mm -hmm. So the 12th house is, is very important. In fact, you can almost look as the 12th Lord, the 12th cusp Lord as well, as another Lagna Lord in the Shastyamsha. So okay. say your Shastyamsha, your Lagna Lord is joined the, you know, the ruler of the seventh in your Shastyamsha. Mm -hmm. You know, relationships is going to become a bigger part of your path all of a sudden. Oh, okay. But if your 12th Lord is joined the seventh Lord, it'll have the same effect where relationships become a bigger part of your path. But, but the twelfth is often related to losing something, right? So it's one thing, but it's conclusions. Conclusions. It's it's the end of the it's the end of the journey. It's the conclusion. Okay. Gotcha. So you can kind of look at it. It's it's the end of the road. It's where you're going to end up, mm -hmm. and where you end up is going to be at a completely different place from where you started. So you're going to lose everything once you get there, right? Right. Like if you move to New York you're going to lose your house. <laughs> you arrive in New York. The conclusion of that is you arrive in New York. Right. And yeah, in life, the conclusion of life is losing everything, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not the end of existence. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. right. So the Shastyamsha is just the resolution and conclusions of those things. Okay. Does my relationship conclude in great happiness or does it conclude in great misery? Mm -hmm. And so the 12th, yeah, the 12th. Uh, yeah. House and the 12th cusp lord they're equally important for seeing where there's a lot of focus in a person's life as the lagna lord okay so if we focus on that 12th house whether that's going to conclude well or not is going to be dependent on the dignity of those plans whether they're gentle or cruel is that what we're looking at uh, here it, what the dignities are how afflicted they are uh -huh. um, things like that this is your standard how to read the chart thing right okay the other thing you have to examine in this Shastyamsha that if you don't know to look for it, you won't think of looking for it. You'll miss some important information is you have to read the 12th house from every planet. Okay. So every planet is a car that's a producer. So Jupiter is going to produce your children and wealth and so on. You know, Venus is going to produce your marriage. And so if I was going to look at the Navamsha, the chart of marriage, I have to study Venus, right? Mm-hmm. And I have to study the ninth from Venus, which is the house of marriage from Venus, to understand the Navamsha properly. If I just go to the Navamsha and read the chart and read the ninth house, I'm going to miss half the picture about their marriage because I didn't read Venus and the ninth from Venus, right? right. Well, and Venus is the karaka for the Navamsha. Mm -hmm. Every varga has a karaka. However, the Shastyamsha is for all things. Mm -hmm. So every planet becomes a karaka of great importance in the varga. Right. in the Shastyamsha, compared to, say, the D40, where the moon is the only super important karaka, mm -hmm. and the D27, and where Mars is the only super karaka. In the D60, all the planets are equally very important karakas. Right. So you have to study every karaka in the D60 to see how good it can give things. Mm -hmm. Then we have to study every house from the karaka. So for property, I have to look at the fourth from Mars. Mm -hmm. Or... Um, Enemies, I have to look at the sixth from Mars. For surgeries, the eighth from Mars, okay, and so on. But then from every planet, the most important house from every planet in the Shastyamsha is the twelfth from that planet. Because it's the final thing. Because it's the final thing that that planet in the end of it is going to leave you with. Right, okay. So when you deal with that karka, the end result, the destination, <laughs> is going to be that twelfth house from that planet. Gotcha. So if it sucks, you're going to be going, how did I get here? Right. This is the last place I was shooting for. If it's great, you're going to go, wow, how did I end up so lucky? And this is going to be, this is going to make it easier to read because those plants, they're definitely going to move through time, but they're not going to move as much as say the Lagna within the Shastyam. Exactly. Except maybe the moon, so right? That, so that you'll get half your information from the planets and half right. from the Bobbins. Gotcha. So the planets, in a few minutes aren't going to change Shastyamsha's, except like you're about to say, 
The moon, if it's right on the edge of a Shashtiyamsha, which means it's really close to the half degree point uh, in the Rosh part, any half degree point, then it's about to change or just change. So in that case, sometimes two seconds will put that moon in a different Mm Shashtiyamsha. But usually you can count on the planets being in the right place, even if your birth time's in question up to 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So you can use half the Shashtiyamsha. But... The amount, of, the real magic from the Shashtiyamsha comes when you really know it's, um, you have the right house cuts. Because mm-hmm. that confirms everything. If you can line it up and make the prediction add up in the Shashtiyamsha, whether you use transits or dashes or whatever you have, if you can also make the prediction work to be the Shashtiyamsha, you can be sure that's a prediction that's going to come true. Right. If you don't verify it in the Shashtiyamsha, because the Shashtiyamsha is wrong, you don't know how to use the Shashtiyamsha, you just don't want to use it, you have to understand you're shooting at that prediction with one eye closed. Right. But um, the thing about astrology, lots of things will oftentimes add up from lots of points because we're dealing with planets and houses and karakas and houses from karakas, right? Right. So there's a good chance it's indicated in the Shashtamsha because mm-hmm. there's so many ways it can be indicated. And the way astrology works, we literally have tiers. We have the Rashi chart, the Varga chart, and then the D45 and the D60 are the two Vargas that deal with all things. So the time something gets filtered through all those Vargas, say something's just shown on average and 25% in each of these Vargas, by the time you filter it out, it's only going to happen one out of 16 times. It mm. reduces it dramatically. So by not using that important filter, the Shashtiyamsha, sometimes we might expect things that aren't going to come true. Right. Right. That's okay. a good safe way to add. Yeah. Well, then, how do you how do you include like the the names and the gods and the goddesses within the Shashtiyamsha? How do you apply okay. those in particular? Yeah, all the Varya deities and and have these strange deities, these strange gods. Yeah. And the um, Shashtiyamsha has, I would say, perhaps the strangest deities and the strangest gods and the strangest flavor to them. And they're very defined in that they're broken into, you know, cruel and auspicious ones. Right. Okay. Um, well, the, and again, the deities are not as important as what's going on in the chart. Okay. So if you have a planet afflicted in the chart, and it's in a nice Shashtiyamsha, has a nice Shashtiyamsha deity attached to it, well, look at that as a nice deity that you've pissed off. <laughs> okay. Like, you know, do you want Krishna mad at you? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, you don't, right? right? Okay. Now, Krishna mad at you is not going to be as bad as, say, Kali mad at you or something, right? Or somebody tough mad at you. Okay. So it's better to have no. someone tough mad at you? At the end of the day, the important thing is you don't want anyone mad at you. <laughs> right. So if the planet's afflicted, that planet's not going to give you what you want. All right. But it's going to be more severe and more painful if it's in an, a difficult Shashtiyamsha deity. Okay. And it's a benign one. And I know it's, you know. And then you can add, if you understand those deities and learn those deities, you can add some flavor to your predictions. Right. Uh, in, a, in an artistic, symbolic sense. Mm-hmm. But the bottom line is what the planets are doing is the most, is the starting point and the foundation of that. So the afflictions in your mind are things like in a difficult house, in bad dignity. Is that what you're... Bad dignity joined with Saturn and Rahu. Okay. Rashi affected by Saturn and Rahu. Would you use the lords of cusps or houses like, you know, um, six or eight? I, I always start with lord of cusps. And lord when I read cusps. the chart, I focus on lord of cusps. Okay. Now, when it comes to predicting what a Dasha lord will do, mm-hmm. say Venus rules the um, ninth Rashi from the Ascendant. Yes. Or not being a, say a planet rules the ninth Rashi from the Ascendant. Okay. It's not going to be the most important planet for determining ninth house affairs. Okay. The most important planet for determining ninth house affairs will be the Lord of the ninth cusp. Right. But during the Dasha of that ninth Lord Rashi as counted from the Ascendant, not the cusp Lord, but the Rashi Lord from the Ascendant, ninth house effects can happen. Okay. So you have to use that the time event. Say, oh, this planet can trigger a ninth house event. Right. But okay. the essence of a person's ninth house events, what they're really going to end up getting is going to be based on that ninth Varga cusp, the influences to it, and its lore. 
Gotcha. So for I example, if you use both. both. Use both, right. But if you have like the 10th house or the 10th bhava, but the 10th cusp is not in it, say it's in the 9th uh, Rashi, then that 10th um, bhava itself, that can activate things or trigger things, but the actual thing that you get will be based on the sign, the Rashi, that that cusp is in, correct? Yeah. The bottom line of that thing, during the dasha of that, you know, 10th Lord from the Rashi, right. the thing you get will have the flavor of that. But at the end of it, as life gets settled and things work their ways out, you're going to get stuck with that baba cusp. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. A baba means concrete existing, for mm -hmm. those who don't know. Um, and a baba cusp is the concrete existing actual thing that you're going to end up with. Right. And so you want that to be solid. And, and a lot of people make a big deal out of this, right? Because we, we use the Campanus system. At least I do. You still use it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you still use it. Um, and, you know, people say you shouldn't do that. But, you know, there is a portion in Brihat Parashar Hora Shastra where it kind of intimates that the cusp and the house itself aren't going to be the same thing. So it is yeah. actually a part of Vedic astrology. Yeah, definitely. The house systems are part of Vedic astrology. Unfortunately, house systems are something that people started using incorrectly. Mm-hmm. And as a result, wisely, a lot of people stopped using them. Uh, it's better to not use house cusps than to use house cusps incorrectly. What's an example of how, they're using, how they might have been using it incorrectly? Like just as to, using them as boundaries to define where a planet is placed in the chart. Right. So you never say, oh, you never draw lines through the house cusps and say, okay, this is the boundary line. Right. This is where the house ends and this is where it begins as counted from the Ascendant. Mm -hmm. The 6th, 8th, and 12th Rashis from the Ascendant are contrary to a person's path, and therefore planets in them are going to be more difficult to deal with. All right. Don't, count, don't divide that. You don't. You know not to. But some astrologers divide those spaces based on the house cusp. Mm -hmm. And the minute they do that, it falls apart. So... You can't use house cups as boundaries. Mm -hmm. Now, that's something that astrologers started doing in the West and possibly, and also in the East, because of the fact that um, they weren't using Vargas. So they were trying to find a way to differentiate why our lives are so different. I see. And so they tried using these house cups. So, like in Western astrology, the debate is what house system, what house system, what house system? I have to be this house system because my planet has to be in this house. Right. Bullshit. Your plan doesn't have to be in that house because it's in this Varga in this house. Right. And then you have your answer, you know? Right. So trying to make house cusps do something that Vargas were meant to do has led people, which basic is to differentiate different people's births who are born close together. Mm -hmm. Why I'm different than you, mm -hmm. you know, when you're born close together has caused house cusps to be used incorrectly. It's interesting, the Greek guys who, the, you know, the, there's a renaissance in Greek medieval astrology led by Robert Hand and a few other good stalwart astrologers. And one of the first things they did, they're very open minded because there's a lot of confusion about what the Greeks did. And even at the time of the Greeks, they used three zodiacs. Hmm. Some of them used tropical, some used sidereal, and others started the, um, zero degrees Aries, eight degrees away from the vernal equinox. So what we call eight degrees Aries, some astrologers called zero degrees Aries back then. Hmm. And some people still follow those methods. I met an astrologer once who had this chart, this calculator thing that you, you, they tell you what your ascendant was with tropical and you'd move a dial and say, actually, this is how we would read your ascendant. <laughs> wow. <Like>, what? <laughs> so, there's all this really kind of strange stuff. Yeah. But, so even at the Greek time, it wasn't like the Greeks said this is the right way. So these Greek astrologers had to try to figure out the right way. But they didn't have a, they didn't have a, um, a lineage of people telling them to do it a certain way. They just had these old books, and they said, well, let's just try it. Mm -hmm. So they tried it. They said, what works better, tropical or sidereal? They tested it. Wow, so tropical worked better. They said, okay, should we use Bavacus to define house spaces? Mm -hmm. Or should we use Rashis to define house spaces? They tried it. They decided to use Rashis for house spaces because it worked better. Right. I believe a lot of them tossed house cusps out, don't use them at all. Mm -hmm. But I believe you still need to use the house cusps as a point in the Rashi. And, you know, 
predicting things to the exact day become possible when we use house cusps um, to the Rashi's with transits. And we use transits based on what a planet rules, not just in the Rashi chart, but particularly in the Shashti Amsha chart. Right. In fact, a transit will only give an effect in accordance with what it rules in the Shashti Amsha chart. Mm -hmm. It rules something in your Rashi and it rules something in your Vamsha, and it doesn't also somehow rule that thing in the Shashti Amsha, it won't bring about the event to mm -hmm. show you how important that Shashti Amsha is. And it's the same important in all things. But you have to read it from lots of places. If you're running the Dasha of the 12th Lord from Venus in your Shashti Amsha, that's going to be a relationship-centered Dasha. Right. In the Navamsha, you would look at the ninth from Venus for marriage and the Saptamsha, maybe the seventh from Venus and things like that. But in the Shashtamsha, you need to look at, is it the seventh Lord from Venus? Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's the 12th Lord from Venus. And if so, it can be a relationship, it's going to be a relationship-centered Dasha. Well, this also explains why <clears throat> it's so hard to actually rectify a chart. <laughs> yeah. You know, people ask me, why do you charge so much? And it's because... You know, I'm going into the Shashti Amsha, the D45, the D40, all the Vargas, and by the time you get done, you've spent like, what, 12 hours trying to figure out like when their cat died. <laughs> yeah, and it's extremely painful. I mean, I say, why do rectification cost, why do rectifications cost so much? Because mm -hmm. I've only got so much hair to pull out. Right. <laughs> rectifications, extremely painful work. Yeah. And I see these astrologers come up with these crazy rectifications. In fact, I got an email from someone yesterday, an astrologer, said, oh, this one event can only happen from this time. And they changed their birth time for like two hours. Yeah. I'm like, what? That's not, you, you know it's wrong. Your time's not off two hours. It's well, just not written on your birth certificate. I've got, I've got you beat. Someone wrote to me and uh, they said that their birth chart was rectified by a particular astrologer and that the astrologer said they were actually born like 18 hours before. So, I mean, you know, that kind of stuff, it's mind-boggling, mind really. And what some astrologers do, they're actually using progressions with the Ascendant mm -hmm. and other house cusp to try to make in those progressions exact, and it, it just doesn't work. Right. But um, rectification is possible, but honestly, most astrologers attempt it, absolutely fail in it mm -hmm. because they aren't using the Varga charts. Right. And so they're coming up with these crazy ideas on how to rectify a chart that just don't cut it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and Shashti Amsha is one of the critical things. Um, if you can rectify the chart to the right Shashti Amsha Lagna, you've got their time nailed down quite tight. Right. Yeah. And so going back to the idea of reading the Shashti Amsha, <clears throat> you know, we don't pull planetary aspects into the Vargas, but we do use things like Lajitati Avashtas in the Vargas. And yeah. those, those are based off the planetary aspects from the birth chart, correct? Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about that so folks can understand, you know, what, what exactly we're talking about here? Okay. Well, first of all, the question is, why don't we use planetary aspects in the Vargas? Right. Well, first of all, let's go back to when we started talking about these old charts that people handed me that just had the Rashi and the Chandra Lagna. <clears throat> so we come from a background of really not a lot of astrologers using Vargas. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of books that focus on them a little bit but nothing really elaborate. There's a couple of yogas that include the Drekana, the Navamsha, and the Shashti Amsha. And then otherwise, we're talking, a, a, you know, five yogas for right. each of those, you know, hardly anything. So we, Vargas haven't been used a lot. And K.N. Rao really started pushing, he was probably the first author that was really pushing heavy use of Vargas. Vivi Ramon was very heavy with the Navamsha. So he always, he never looked at anything without the Navamsha. So all of his work was Rashi Navamsha, Rashi Navamsha. Right. Um, Ken Rao started really, sh in his writings, really showing how we should be using these other Varga charts. Um, so really, it's a new part of astrology. Traditionally, astrologers who looked at Varga charts did not use the aspects in the Varga charts, the planetary right. aspects. Right. The reason that is because planetary aspects are a spatially based thing. We have the circle, planets that are opposite each other in the circle aspect each other. So a planet in Aries is a planet opposite Libra, and they aspect each other. Well, if we look at a Varga, you have a planet in Aries and a planet in Libra. In the sky, they, in, meaning in the Rashi chart, they may not be opposite each other. Right. So spatially, there's no aspect. Planetary aspects are a spatial type of aspect. And so... 
traditionally Vedic astrologers didn't look at them in the Vargas. Um, however, that's something that got crept into Vedic astrology, and I used to use it, but I found it doesn't work great to use it, and it actually just works a lot better to only use planetary aspects in the Vargas or in the Rashi and carry that over. So if you've got Saturn aspecting your moon to 45 points in your Rashi chart, that aspect's going to impregnate your moon everywhere. Right. And, you know, let's do, the reason I use that example, let's take a person who's got a strong Saturn aspect in their moon. Mm -hmm. They're with a planetary aspect. Mm -hmm. They're a worrisome person. They're going to get anxious and nervous and stressed really easily. Mm -hmm. They're going to do it in every area of life. Right. 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 It's not like in the Navamsha, Saturn is not aspecting the moon. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to marriage, they're not stressed, right? No. Right. They're stressed about every department of their life. <laughs> right. Because that aspect carries through to all the bargains. Uh -huh. Now, they might handle the stress somewhat better in one area of life than the other because of the dignity of Saturn and the moon in those bargains. But mm -hmm. they're still going to have an overall influence of having a stressful attitude about everything that happens in their life. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, and make a bigger deal out of things than they really need to in every area of their life, not just one or two areas. Right. So, when you're dealing with planetary aspects, you're very much dealing with the subjective part of the person, how mm -hmm. they're relating to things. How we relate to things is a fundamental quality of who we are. Um, and then there's the concrete realities of our life. Those dramatically change in our life. Like a person, concrete reality can be they're wealthy, but lonely, mm -hmm. right? And that's where we look at the Varga charts and examine the Rashi aspects which are different in the Varga chart. In every chart, you have different Rashi aspects and different conjunctions, which show us the different concrete realities we have. Right. But we're going to all those concrete realities with the same degree of stress if we have a Saturn moon influence. Right. So we don't want to use aspects, planetary aspects, and carry them into the Vargas. One of the best things any astrologer can do to immediately go from being mediocre in reading their chart to being way better than they ever were is simply adding Rashi aspects to their interpretations. Just well, that easy. Yeah, but the problem with that is, is that there's some interesting ideas about what they're for. I mean, some people say that, um, you know, you don't want to mix Rashi aspects because that's a Jaimini thing, but really, you know, it's just part of a, that's a part of an equation that mm -hmm. when you add it together, you come to the final result. So the idea with the Rashi aspects, I mean, what we, we use them for the concrete aspects of things, right? Yeah. Um, and the, the planetary aspects, as you were saying, that's a subjective, like how's a planet going to interact with another planet, right? And how you're going to relate to the things, yeah. Right. And the Rashis themselves are the fields or the garden in which your life grows out of. Mm -hmm. so those Rashi aspects are going to be sharing, like what is the foundation or the background or the body of the thing, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and how do you, like, how would you encourage people to uh, interweave both of those things? Because they're going to show different things, but they're going to be together in the same equation to give you the final result. Well, since they're showing different things, use them for what you want to see. If you right. want to see the concrete reality of a person's life, if a yeah. person says, am I going to have a job, use Rashi aspects and conjunctions. Right. That's a concrete thing. You either have a job or, or you yeah. don't have a job, right? <laughs> and Jamie aspects, they either are on or they're not on. Right. But Planetary the aspects are almost always on, but to different degrees. However, most astrologers use planetary aspects as either, all, either on or off, which is not a correct way to use them in the first place. Oh, they oh because they're not using the points. Aspects, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So they say, oh, planets aspect each other when they're opposite. And Jupiter aspects that fifth and ninth as well, and Saturn the third and tenth, and Mars the fourth and eighth. Right. And that's all they use. They only use those full aspects. Mm -hmm. Well, the truth is, planets aspect every point just to different degrees, other than the first 30 degrees in front of them and the last 60 degrees behind them. Otherwise, they have a field of vision where they see Drishti aspect things to different degrees. Right. And that's really how planetary aspects are meant to be used. Um, essentially, most astrologers aren't really using aspects. They're simply using oppositions. 
Right. They're saying, oh, these plants are opposite, therefore you have a yoga. Right. But with the, with the, with the Rashi aspects, yeah, they're off or they're on, right? But yeah. they can be on in a bad way. <laughs> yeah, they can be, which means a concrete thing that sucks. Right, exactly. And, right. You're, and you're looking at, just to be clear for the people who are watching, you're looking at dignity there, correct? Or well, you're looking at malefic or cruel and gentle. But also the planet aspect in itself. Okay. So in Jaimini, the best aspect is the aspect of Mercury, Jupiter, or the Lord of Arashi to the law of Arashi. Right. That ensures the productivity of that Rashi. Those are the plants that can make a Rashi manifest in a concrete, usable, productive way. Mm -hmm. And anything in that Rashi, any house cusp, any planet is going to manifest that concrete reality. Mm -hmm. Then Saturn and Rahu are separators. They cause the concrete realities that cause losses and separations. Right. So we don't want those Rashi aspecting anything. Those are the sort of the two extremes. Okay? You, said, you said Saturn and Rahu, right? Yeah. What about the sun? Is that not the at all? The sun is a minor separator. Okay. He will take us away from things, but not with the, with the pain and feelings of loss that Saturn Rahu does. Okay. Sun okay. does it because he has something greater to do, so he's not going to bother with that other thing. He's mm -hmm. ambitious towards something else. So you feel like you might lose something, but you're doing it because you're trying to win something else. Right. Where Saturn and Rahu... We lose something and we're wondering why, why did this happen to me? You know? Right. Um, so the look for the, the Rashi is influenced by Mercury, Jupiter and their Lord are going to be doing the best. And the better those plants are in dignity, the better those things are going to be. Gotcha. Okay. Now, anytime a plant's exalted, it's going to strengthen any Rashi at aspects to some degree. So mm -hmm. exalted Saturn, exaltation means high. If Saturn exalted influences a Rashi, there's going to be something high about that Rashi of a Saturnian quality. Mm -hmm. And that will no longer hurt the Rashi. Okay? Mm -hmm. But it's still nicer to have Mercury or Jupiter or the lore of the Rashi influence the Rashi. Right. That's what you really want. That gives, that's the Rashis you want. Those areas of life that the concrete reality is a desirable concrete reality. Right. And so these main ideas, I mean, there's a lot there. You cover this in your Jaimini One course. Is that correct? No, all this stuff, I have a course called um, Chart and Varga Analysis with Jaimini. Okay. Where I cover all these principles of reading all 16 Vargas. Okay. It's like a long course where I cover every Varga. As far as, and in that course, I teach how to take a chart and read this Varga. And mm -hmm. get the essence of it. Is this Varga going to suck or be nice to them or be mediocre? Then I just started a course called Concrete Predictions with Jaimini, where I'm using those principles along with some other Vimshatri principles mm -hmm. to use Vimshatri Dasha to predict concrete, the concrete realities of a person's life. All right. Okay, now the funny thing about a concrete reality, you never can say in predicting it, you can't say, oh, this is going to be a good time for you based on a concrete reality right. they may say am i gonna fall in love and you can look and say you'll yes you'll fall in love so it'll be a good time mm -hmm. those are two different things you require two different predictions the concrete reality is you will fall in love and that'll be shown by jamie mercury the lord of the rashi somehow being supportive and making that concrete reality of having someone in their life having a partner mm -hmm. but if that person subjectively feels lack of self-love and can't get along with anyone, mm -hmm. they won't be happy with that concrete reality. It still won't be good enough for them. All right. So that's when you have to turn to other techniques to say, but let's see how you're going to feel once right. you have Mr. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. oh, according to this, you're going to, according to these avashtas, the parashar avashtas, even though the concrete reality is, wow, I'm getting married, how you're going to, feel because of your subjectivity of how you feel about yourself and what you're expecting that's unreasonable you're going to feel miserable or you're going to feel wonderful right so and, and one of those is based things. one of those is based on the vimshatari nakshatra dasha and the other is based on the jaimini rashi dasha correct yes but even more specifically one of those is based on planetary aspects yeah vimshatri and right. the other one is based on rashi aspects using rashi dashas or vimshatri Essentially, one's based oh, on yeah. okay. predictions, 
And other ones based on predicting the person's reactions to their concrete life. I see. Which ultimately is the more important thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because if a person gets all their desires met, but can't find happiness in all of them, what's the point of all those things, right? Whereas if a person cannot have any concrete reality met, but is still able to find happiness in what they, the little they do have, that's more important, right? Mm -hmm. So for, as an astrologer, we need to understand the person and see, are they even going to be happy when I predict the right thing? And okay. so often, aren't they not happy? No. <laughs> exactly. So those are two levels of prediction. Prediction, yeah. predicting how the person's going to experience their life based on who they are, mm -hmm. which Vimshatri Dasha is the key Dasha for that with planetary aspects and Lajitadi Vashtas. Mm -hmm. Then they're predicting the concrete reality with Vimshatri and some Vimshatri tools that I'm covering in this new course. Okay. One of the tools being using Rashi aspects. Now, some astrologers might say, don't use Rashi aspects with Vimshatri, da, da, da. Well, I mean, you're, you're only doing that because you're a neocolonialist, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not like that. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. The question is, should we or shouldn't we do it? The Rashi aspects were found in ancient texts of which there's only fragments of, Mm -hmm. called the Vrita Karikas, these ancient astrological texts, they used Rashi aspects, and there was no mention of planetary aspects. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about Rashi aspects is anyone who's tried to look through Jaimini or look through a different, couple different versions of Jaimini or who knows Sanskrit and try to read Jaimini in the pure form realize Jaimini is so secretly decoded, nobody knows what the hell he wants us to do. Mm -hmm. One of the most crazy sutras is the sutra on aspects it's one of the most convoluted sutras mm -hmm. yet everyone who has translated jaimini every jaimini commentator throughout history agrees on what the rashi aspects are mm -hmm. there's tons of other sutras in jaimini that are way less complex than the aspect sutra way mm -hmm. easier to understand that and yet everyone disagrees about them mm -hmm. Which makes me think there was a time when Rashi aspects were an understood thing. Right. You didn't have to talk about it. This is the bread and butter part of astrology. We have two bits of evidence supporting that that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I found long ago that using yogas with Rashi aspects get better results mm -hmm. than with planetary aspects. Um, when it comes to concrete predictions, Rashi aspects work better than planetary aspects. They just do. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so I think it's a part of astrology that was understood, was a big part of astrology. And, you know, it's a shame we've lost these Vrita Karakas, you know, and they were from about 300 to 600 BC mm -hmm. um, because we don't know what wealth of knowledge was really there. Mm -hmm. but the very fact that everyone agrees on how to do Rashi aspects, when it's perhaps one of the two hardest sutras in the text, you know? Right. <laughs> wonder when there's no other difficult suture that any two translators or commentators agree upon right but this seems to be kind of like a new time for bringing about rashi aspects i mean because i remember when i first learned astrology no one ever told me about rashi aspects they would sure. like they would roll over and say yeah maybe look at that but no one ever told me what they were for how to use them so i'm, I'm kind of curious do you think that maybe now we're reaching a point where we can actually think about how to apply rashi aspects better i mean just like we got the bargain Definitely. Yeah, yeah, finally people are starting to use that. And you have to understand, Jaimini was sort of this undiscovered, undiscovered text until recently. Mm. Same with Brihat Parashar. Interesting, we don't know what in Parashar has been added to it that wasn't part of the original, mm -hmm. but because it was recompiled in the 1800s from fragments or found around India. But an interesting thing is, Parashara gives the Rashi aspects as one of the first chapters. Right. After that, he gives chapters on yogas for the houses. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't even mention planetary aspects until right before the Shadbala chapter. Mm -hmm. And one of the strengths that makes up Shadbala is the Drigbala, which is the aspect of benefic and malefics. And you mm -hmm. have to know that aspect not as on or off, but as what's the value from zero to 60. Mm -hmm. so he doesn't mention planetary aspects until Shadbala chapter. Right. Yet he's already told us about all these yogas based on aspects and all these things based on aspects. 
that he didn't start telling us until after the Rashi aspect chapter. Mm -hmm. So if that Rashi aspect chapter is not a misguided part of the compilation, if it was not accidentally recompiled in there, it really makes it a no-brainer that Rashi aspects are way more important for concrete predictions than our planetary aspects. Right. Yeah, well, all of it's fascinating. <laughs> I know. So again, the proof is in the pudding. If a pe person uses it and it works for them, that's ultimately what they need to work with. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why um, when I'm looking at a chart, I, I lean more towards Rashi aspects now because what you're saying, people are going to ask questions like, uh, well, am I going to be happy or am I going to get this or whatever it might awesome. be. And they're, they're, not, they're not related. You know, people act like if I just get this job, then I'm going to be happy. Or if I just meet this person, I'm going to be happy. And like it's, yeah. there's a point in the chart that represents happiness and there's a point in the chart that represents a thing. And yes. that's... They're, 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 it's coincidental when you find that together. At least that's what yeah. I found. Totally. They're two different things. And most of the people come to astrologers for predictions, and right. Vedic astrologers usually attract people who want predictions. They just want to know the concrete reality. Mm -hmm. And to tell that, the easiest way to tell that, it's just much easier with Rashi aspects. Right. Okay. Well, good. So we'll just tie all that into the, the Shashtiyamsha there. So we should look at the birth chart. We should look at the Shashtiyamsha, compare the two. And the Shashtiyamsha is going to give us at the end of the day, what are we going to get? What's the experience going to be like, correct? What's the, what's the finality of that concrete reality? So but we want to also, of course, look at the pertinent Varga too, whatever area of life we're looking at, study that Varga chart. So if we're studying marriage, studying the Navamsha, Navamsha. and the Shashtiyamsha. Okay, so you wouldn't just look at the, you couldn't just look at the Shashtiyamsha because you, you use the Rashi chart, the birth chart to give a sense of what is the direction that the person's going to be walking on, the path they're going to be on. Yeah. And then the Shashtiyamsha is the final result. Yeah, and I, I really the best way to work it is look at it, like you said, the Rashi is showing your path you're on. Mm -hmm. So this is what I'm focused on. This is where I'm going. Am I going towards my career? Am I going towards wealth? Am I going towards children? Am I going towards love? Am I going towards crisis and disaster, mm -hmm. that's the road I'm on. Along that road, a lot of things are going to happen. Um, on the road to crisis, I might find my wife, and that's going to be indicated in the Navamsha. Mm -hmm. Or on the road to love, shown in the Rashi chart by, say, a strong seventh house focus in the Rashi chart, mm -hmm. I might find myself getting sick and struggling and working on my health because the trim samsha, the chart of disease gets triggered. Right. So we have the road we're on, but many things happen on that road. It's kind of like we may say, oh, I'm going to take a road trip to New York. Mm -hmm. I'm going to New York. But along that road to New York, so many things happen that have nothing to do with New York at all. Right. Now, and that's what all the other bargers are showing. Mm -hmm. But the things that happen along the road to New York that are about New York are going to be the most important things, right? Mm -hmm. So if I pick up a hitchhiker who's really hot and we have a great time and she's into astrology and we talk and we just have a blast, then I drop her off in New Jersey. Well, that was a great part of my road trip. Right. <laughs> if I picked her up and she happened to be an agent that worked in New York and her car broke down and she just has to get there in New York for a meeting and I drive her there, and I want to be an actor in New York, and all of a sudden I got this great connection in New York, that's even better, right? Right. So if it's shown in the Rashi chart and it's shown in the Varga chart, it's better than if it's not shown in the Rashi and it's shown in the Varga because it's part of where you really want your life to go at that time. Right. Then you're really into it. So mm -hmm. if you get married during a dasha because you know Vamsha is showing it, but your Rashi is not saying, oh, I'm all about marriage, you're like, you just kind of pick up this marriage as a side trip to where you're going, you know? Right. Just kind of works out nicely, but it wasn't where you really your whole life was focused on, right? Right. But in the sense, it's not as viable of a thing to you then. Well, I mean, that then, explains. Okay. Okay. No, go ahead. Then the Shashti Amsha, you need to look at the Rashi and the Varga. The Shashti Amsha is going to show really the finality of what you get. Right. Both the road trip, the Rashi, the goal, your direction of life. And also with respect to everything you pick up along the way as indicated by the Vargas. Right. So if your Navamsha is showing marriage, okay, what marriage are you really getting? Let's analyze that by looking at the D60. Mm -hmm. If the D60 says nothing about marriage, it's probably not going to happen. You wouldn't want to predict that. But let's say 
The Navamsha doesn't say marriage, and the D60 does. Don't predict it. The okay. Varga has to predict it too. So you can't just use Raji and Shastyamsha and make correct predictions. Right. You have to use the Varga. It's right. Critical. So the so the Rashi is the path you're on, the Shastyamsha is the end, and the things that happen in between are the things you would look at within the Vargas. Yeah, the things that happen along the road. Not right. actually in between, but along the road. Right. Okay. At the twelfth house, the, the Shastyamsha and the twelfth lets us just see the the road from a more, we can say, a better perspective. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. From okay, what am I gonna be what's the result of it? What's it what's it really gonna be? Right. So you look like, oh, I met someone who's wonderful. Well, really, how wonderful is your marriage going to be? And that's from the, that's from the uh, yeah. yeah. Just, it, and is it going to be allowed to really happen? Is it going to be good enough to really happen? Is right. it really going to be something that's an end in my life? Because everything right. we obtain is an end. Uh-huh. I can even say that. What's your end game? Mm-hmm. My end game is to get married. Okay, let's look at the Shashtemsha. My end game is to be famous. All right, let's look at the Shashtemsha. Okay. Right. <laughs> right. Gotcha. The 12th house is the end, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Excellent. you can say the end game is the 12th house. And when you study a person's 12th house, you can see what their end game is, mm-hmm. what they're trying to create at the finality of it all. Right. The so people got really twisted 12 houses. They've got a twisted end game and you don't want to really hang out with them. <laughs> How's your 12th house? Uh, I don't rem- I can exalt the 12th floor. Don't you know? Oh, oh, yes, that's right. Okay. <laughs> 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 my best planet, actually. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so you can trust my end game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can trust me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah, you're all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, good. Well, I mean, that's a pretty good crash course in Shastiyamsha's, Vargas, Rashi aspects, and so on. Is there anything else on your mind that you think you'd like to share about that that people you think people should know or pay attention to or explore more? Well, I think just to clarify, unless a person's sure of the birth time very accurately or they know how to rectify the Shastyamsha, just start by examining the planets in it right. and the 12th from the planet. Okay. And see how that meet, meets your expectations of reality, of how your life really is. And you'll find it'll explain some of the things that maybe you couldn't make sense of looking at other places. Right. Like, like, gosh, my, I, I was in the Dasha of an exalted planet when I got married, yet... I hardly get along with mm-hmm. my wife. Oh, look, in the Shastyamsha, that planet is debilitated in the 12th house from Venus. No wonder. No wonder. Right. You know, right. like that. So you're and then you'll realize, wow, I need to look at these when I look at people's charts. Otherwise, I might skew my prediction a little bit right. and be off track a little bit. Well, so two questions. So the first one is you're looking at the 12th from the planet, but would you also encourage them to look at the – the, the appropriate house from the planet, like you were talking about the ninth yeah. from, so the third from Mars. Okay. Look at the appropriate house from the planet and the, finally the 12th from that planet. Okay. And this would also <clears throat> encourage people, hopefully astrologers, to maybe get a little bit of background information about their clients because then that can help you understand how they're working with that. Yes. Right. Okay, great. So, you know, I just wanted to bring that up because there's often this idea that the astrologer should just look at the chart and all of a sudden be able to go off on so many different directions. But if you get that baseline, it can help you dial in that Shastyamsha so that your work is actually better in the long run. Yeah, it, it can be a really helpful thing to get that Shastyamsha dialed in right. uh, and make a better reading. And lots of ways, the good way to start with that is just to say, oh, look at the Shastyamsha and say, okay, in this period of life, did you have a lot of good stuff happen or struggles with this area of life that's getting triggered? Right. And if they say no, then just move the time a second and say, oh, actually, was it in this area? Because now that lo- planet rules a different cusp. Right. And then they'll say, oh, yeah, it was that area. Okay, then you know. And, that's and always it- a better way to do it than to ask them directly and say, hey, tell me about what happened in the last five years. I want to check this chart. Right. And so with that, you, with the time that you're talking about, just so people understand, you're talking about the, the Vimshotari Dasha? Like, are you looking at this? Yeah, things? look at the Vimshotari Dasha Lord, the Maha okay. Dasha Lord, especially. The Maha Dasha Lord, if you want to look, the Maha Dasha Lord is important in all of Vargas. Mm-hmm. But where the Maha Dasha Lord is most important is in the Shastyamsha Varga. Gotcha. So lots of times, in fact, there's a certain Vargas that are 
where different dasha lords have more impact in. Mm -hmm. The Mahadasha Lord has the most impact in the Shastyamsha amongst all the other Varga charts. So okay. when you do that, focus on the Mahadasha, not the Antardashas. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, I saw you yawn in there, so I've either bored you or you're tired. So we'll, we'll, we'll go no, ahead. No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's go ahead and just conclude this, this little segment here on the, the Shastyamsha. I think that gives people enough to digest for a while. Definitely. All right. Well, it's good seeing you, Ernst. Thanks for Thank coming. You. All right. You bet.